Hi, I'm Zach Davis, co-host of the Jesuitical Podcast. You're about to hear a great conversation with Cardinal Robert McElroy, the Bishop of San Diego. We dive into his recent article on radical inclusion and the future of the Catholic Church, which you can read at americamagazine.org. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the button below. Joining us from San Diego is Cardinal Robert McElroy. Cardinal McElroy is the Bishop of San Diego and the author of the new article at AmericanMagazine.org on radical inclusion for LGBT people, women, and others in the Catholic Church. Welcome to Jesuitical, Cardinal. Great to be with you. First of all, uh, we were talking about this internally, and we were trying to decide how to refer to you. And, you know, on the one end, we have, like, your most eminent, preeminent Nince to to Bob. Um, so somewhere in the middle of those two extremes, uh, how should we refer to you? Let's see if we either do Cardinal Bishop or whatever. All right, Cardinal. All right, that sounds good, Cardinal. Um, and secondly, wanted to thank you. You've been writing for America for a long time. Um, there, you know, there's articles on the website going back to when you were uh, Monsignor McElroy, but I know you've been a, a long supporter of the magazine and contributed to our pages for a long time. So wanted to thank you. A lot. I think my first was in 2003 or so. Okay. okay. Yeah. Long before we got here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, I didn't get here till 2015 and actually 2013. So yeah. you, you've got a longer standing relationship with America than we do. So so thank you. So we do want to get to your uh, article on radical inclusion a bit later. It sparked a lot of conversation in the wider church. But first, because you are the first cardinal to come on Jesuitical, we want to ask you a bit about your ministry. Um, uh, what's what's a day in the life uh, as a cardinal in the church? I know it's only been uh, less than a year, but uh, maybe you can give us, our listeners uh, a taste of what, what your new role is. Well, uh I've been Bishop of San Diego for eight years, and I continue in that role. And that's my principal life and and ministry. Uh, That hasn't changed much. The the role of a cardinal really has a couple of different elements to it. Um, But in a sense, they're all side jobs. Uh, My my primary uh, ministry is here as being Bishop of San Diego. And we have have about 95 parishes and and, uh, about 50 schools and uh, a lot of organizations that work with the poor and the marginalized and uh, 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 particularly here with immigrants and refugees who are we're a huge border uh, with Mexico. And so our Catholic charities are tremendously involved in working with refugees, which is uh, to the order of about 200 a day. Um, so, uh, so that's my principal work. Uh, the work of a cardinal is a couple of things. One is... Um, uh, I feel almost like Prince Harry, a spare. You know, you're, you're there and wait. You're, you're there and waiting for when there's a, a, a pope has either resigned or dies, and then you're part of the conclave, of the electors to to elect a new pope. So we're spares till then. Uh, in addition, though, uh, at, at the Vatican they have a series of committees. Uh, many of the departments are effectively. Uh, c- collectives. They're, they're not just a single individual uh, running it. And so uh, the cardinals are on from different parts of the world are on those committees. I'm on two of them. So I have to be in Rome sometimes for those committee meetings. Uh, and, and then uh, thirdly, uh, the work of a cardinal is to try to assist the Pope in various ways in uh, maintaining the unity and the uh, uh, universality of the church. So those are kind of the three elements of being a cardinal, but all of them are really secondary to my primary role, which is as the Bishop of San Diego. Picking up on that third uh, responsibility that you mentioned, um, y- without betraying confidence, what's your relationship with Pope Francis like? Is, um, are you guys um, texting all the time or like what? No. Like, what? No, no, we don't. Te- we don't text all the time, and uh, uh, when we uh, mostly when I speak with them is when I'm over in Rome for something, um, and uh, w- with conversations about different issues, many of which are about the United States and the Church in the United States. He always asks what's going on with with the refugees and the migrants. That's a huge mm. concern to him, um, and so we we speak about that a lot and then and then uh how the church in the united states in general is faring because he has a a lively interest in that 
And why do you think that is, or, or what do you think his hope is for the church here in the United States? Well, of course, his view of the church uh, is really reflected in his view of synodality, which is kind of a culture which includes several elements. That is, of, of listening to God attentively, of listening to one another with respect, of, of inclusiveness and participation, of celebration and rootedness in the Eucharist and the Word of God. Those are kind of uh, the marks of synodality, which synodality is not seeking a particular set of outcomes. It is rather a culture that we're trying to build up in the life of the church so that, uh, that, we, uh, so that we truly listen with respect to one another. It's so difficult in our society now. Uh, across lines where there are uh, deep disagreements. And so uh, that's what I think, when you ask what his vision of the church is, I think he, he, is, he has enunciated it pretty clearly in all of those marks of synodality. Mm. It's interesting that you say that one of your... Um one of your roles is helping to maintain and support the universality of the church, um, and that's part of what the Cardinals uh, College of Cardinals does. Uh, but in recent weeks, we've seen some pretty stark criti- criticisms of the Pope from uh, now your late brother Cardinal, Cardinal George Pell. So I'm curious how you received uh, the news that Cardinal Pell came out with a pretty uh, explosive memorandum uh, that called the Pope's uh, papacy a catastrophe. Um, How do you deal with that sort of disagreement within the college? You know, the church is not a monolithic institution, and there are disagreements about things. You know, there's a tremendous amount of commonality that unites us, you know. Uh, The the primary uh, light of the church is that uh, the, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, Son, Spirit, and our personal relationships that we form with God and that all members of the church uh, strive in their lives to live out and live out the, the teachings of the gospel as best, as best we can, knowing that we all fail in those areas and that we depend upon God's grace. So on the whole range of issues that are the most important part, there's an interesting thing in, in, that's not talked about a lot that's called the hierarchy of truths in Catholic faith. Some people believe, think that uh, the Catholic Church believes that every, every teaching is, is uh, the same in importance. It isn't. Uh, there's a hierarchy of truths means there are certain things that are crucial to being a Catholic. And those are the ones I just talked about. There's a whole lot of teachings that, that go on in the life of the Church that are much less important. Okay? So uh, there are many disagreements. Uh, they're not uh, among the cardinals. The disagreements are not among those I'm talking about at the height of the hierarchy. That's not where they are. They're important disagreements, uh, but they're, they're, they're what's... When I was a pastor, I used to uh, give talks in my own parish and then uh, in other parishes. And one of the things I'd ask people, because we'd be talking about you know, Catholic teaching and what it means, I'd ask people, and we might have a crowd of a couple hundred people, I'd say, uh, somebody would ask about saying, I have a problem with a, a certain teaching of the church, and I find it hard to accept this one. Does that mean I can't be Catholic? So what I would say is, will everyone in the room please raise their hand who obeys every teaching of the church? And you, often there would be one or two men. It was always men who would raise their hand. Of course. Yeah. And not infrequently, their wives would haul their hands down and say, <laughs> say no, you don't. <laughs> so so, so uh, that's important for the context, you know, that all of us, A, find certain things difficult to live out and find certain teachings of the church hard to understand and accept. And so, uh, but it's not in that core area. The, the, the core area is what makes us uh, people of faith and makes us a universal church. And it's not that the other issues are unimportant, but they're not at the very center of what it means to be a Catholic. And so I think any discussion of, you know, where Carlos disagree, and we do disagree on things, but it's not at those, those elements at the heart of the gospel. It's a good point, and it, it's a good segue to talk a little bit about your article, which is— um, caused a lot of uh, debate and disagreement. There have been a number of uh, published responses to it. Uh, in your mind, what's the 
what's the thrust of the essay? Because there are a number of things that other people sort of lasered in on or picked up on. But it, 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 what were you trying to get across is sort of the thesis of the piece. The, the essay I wrote recently for America is part of a trilogy, okay? Uh, last year, I wrote a piece on America, uh, on America on what is the culture of synodality. That is, what is the direction of this? Where is the Holy Father pointing us to go as a church and to be as a church? So that was the first element of it. This is the second, which is on inclusion. And then next month, I have one that's, sorry to tell you, is going to be in common wheel, but it's, uh, uh, which is a, uh, an alternate to America, but but uh, it, it's on it, it's looking at the synodal dialogues that occurred in the United States, and asking what that says about the major elements of synodality, where they're lived out, and where we're, we need to work harder. So it's, those three things need to be taken in context, into in terms of understanding what at least what I'm trying to say. You know, that, that synodality is a process that's crucial. It's a culture, and it, it's a spiritual endeavor. Uh, and, and that's the first piece. This, the second piece is on inclusion. And um, it was clear in the uh, consultation of the 500,000 uh, Catholics in the United States who participated in small group meetings. Um, and and, and I, I want to underscore that is the largest consultation, non-governmental consultation of any kind by any institution in the history of our country. So, so sometimes people are saying, oh, only, only a small percentage of, it's the largest consultation of any kind on any topic by any non-governmental institution in our country's history. So yeah, any, to, any company would be thrilled with that sort level of feedback we, or participation, we, we, right? Wouldn't even dream of that, what, because this wasn't just feedback. You had to go, this is, there were more than that who, who, who participated, about 700,000 participated in various ways, but about 500,000 went to meetings in small groups and shared from their heart on these very basic questions. What are your joys in the church? What are your sorrows? And what are your hopes in the church? And so it, it, it was a major undertaking that, that people shared their hearts and souls in very meaningful ways. Um, uh, in our consultations here in San Diego, uh, one of the most uh, vivid outcomes was that uh, pastors and parish leaders told me that when they had these small group meetings, they were meeting in groups of about eight, and they were sharing uh, uh, the joys and the sorrows and their hopes for the, the church and their lives, and sharing very crucial personal incidents, that the groups left very happy with each other and very spiritually bonded on a variety of ways. And yet, when they looked at the notes for those gatherings, they were disagreeing on issues of substance. That's what synodality is. It's coming together and people sharing and listening and understanding it's a common faith and a common spirituality that binds us together. And then we struggle on a number of these other issues. So the, 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 the article that came out recently uh, deals with questions of inclusion. That's a very difficult, polarized area within our own society now, and it's true within the life of the church. We did a, uh, after our small group uh, synodal meetings, we did a survey of about 27,000 people here in San Diego Catholics uh, on a range of issues. But one of the questions, uh, or three of the questions were on inclusion. Those were the most highly polarized results that we got. Uh, you, you, there were four possible results, uh, strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly agree. And when we did the regression analysis, the statistical analysis, the, the polarization on those inclusion issues was higher by far than any other issue. So it's a very volatile area because it touches uh, deeply in, in human hearts and people's worldviews. Just to get a little more concrete, who are we talking about including or excluding? What, who, are, who are the groups you're addressing in this piece? Well, uh, in the dialogues that occurred uh, uh, for the synodal dialogues across the country, uh, there's now, now a national dialogue, but I've read about 20 dialogues and dialogues too, uh, syntheses, and it's all the same. It, from, from place to place in the country, it's amazing the level of commonality in the major themes. 
So uh, uh, the, the positive themes are, you know, joy in the Eucharist and sacramental life of the church, joy in the community that people find, uh, uh, joy in the hope that they express for the future. Uh, the, the challenges, well, one of them, is, of course, is young adults, which is such an enormous challenge. This is the drifting of young adults out of the church. That probably more than any other was the challenge that came from these dialogues where people were saying, we've got to do something about this. But one of the other sets of, of challenges was on this whole area of inclusion, specifically uh, uh, the treatment of women and um, uh, divorced and remarried LGBT uh, persons. Uh, also in tandem with that, uh, racism, uh, discrimination against ethnic groups, you know, against the, the, the undocumented, all these sorts of marginalization that occurs. So my, my article was an effort to say, all right, the, the people of God have spoken, and while often they're highly polarized in these issues, the clear majority of people are in favor of changes on, uh, on each of these, in each of these areas. So my article is an effort to explore that, how the church might move to uh, lessen exclusion within the, within the life of the church. I was focusing on the internal life of the church. Now, some people heard that and were, uh, I would say, rankled by the idea that inclusion is sort of like a code word for changing church, church teaching or, you know, specifically you talk about sort of um, looking at inclusion and in relationship to the Eucharist and our practice of celebrating the Eucharist. Um, and some people were like, oh, is is Cardinal McElroy in favor of open communion? And, you know, and I can see some reading of that where you, you mentioned that we sort of focus so heavily on issues of sexual morality um, and especially how we exclude people. Are, are you saying that, like, what does that look like practically if we're to sort of remove those barriers? Is it is it open communion? Well, o open communion, it got misinterpreted a little bit in that I used at one point once the word baptized uh, the, all the baptized. I didn't mean non-Catholics. I was talking about it in the context of the church. Sure, sure. Uh, 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 so, but what I was uh, proposing is, and I believe is the right way for us to move in terms of pastoral theology, is that uh, it springs from Pope Francis' notion that the Eucharist is not a price for the perfect. It's, it's healing and medicine for those in need of God's help. Well, that's all of us. And so, it's, it's not a reward. It doesn't go only to, the, to the, the best behaviors. And so our role in the church should be to expand uh, the openness of the Eucharist for all those who are, oh, I'm talking about Catholics now, who are striving to live by the gospel and the teachings of the church. I believe they should all be uh, welcomed into the Eucharist. Does that require a change to the catechism, which does say that, you know, if you approach the Eucharist with a, in a state of grave sin um, without going to confession first, that, you know, you're pouring judgment on yourself um, and damning yourself. So is, is this just a different way of interpreting that, that gives more weight to conscience? Um, well, there are two things here. One is that citation from St. Paul on, on, on uh, drinking and eating unworthily, all right? And, and uh, you, you damn yourself. It's interesting, St. Paul never speaks about what is the subject matter he's talking about there. He never, there's no substance to what he's saying if you do this. And, and what my problem is, we have cast uh, uh, violations of the, of, the, of the Eucharist for which you need to not go to the Eucharist or be, uh, go to confession first each time. We have cast them in, largely in terms of sexual things. We don't say it's automatically a mortal sin to discriminate against somebody. We don't say it's automatically a mortal sin to rip off your employees or exploit them. We don't say it's, it's automatically a mortal sin to mistreat your children or your spouse. Those are very serious elements of the moral life, but we don't automatically say those are mortal sins. We do about, it, it springs from this notion that comes to us from the 16th century, that um, all sexual sins are mortal, okay? And that's what I'm challenging in the, 
in the essay. I, I don't think that's a good part of the Catholic moral tradition. And I think that's going to come as a breath of fresh air to a lot of people, you know, hearing hearing a cardinal say that. Um, it, but it's also going to come as like a real, you know, challenge, a shock, um, because I think for a lot of people, if I if I try to get in their head a little bit, they go, well, wait, I have lived my life as if that were true at, at great sacrifice and cost. And now all of a sudden I feel like, you know, <laughs> The, the rugs being pulled out from under me. Um, how do you like talk to someone who thinks that like this idea of inclusion and welcoming is somehow like undermining um, what we believe or what we have believed as Catholics? Well, let's just look at that whole area of sexuality, for example, uh, where the rubber hits the road for many people. <clears throat> um, and where I'm advocating a change in our pastoral theology. <clears throat> what I am saying is not uh, that we had to wrestle with sinfulness in all its various forms in our sexual lives. Our sexual lives have many areas of sinfulness in them. I'm not challenging that. I'm not changing the contours of that. All I'm saying is that in the Christian moral life, they don't automatically represent mortal sin. Mortal sin in Catholic teaching is a sin so grave that it is objectively capable of cutting off our relationship with God. That's pretty severe. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm saying is that framework doesn't fit, but that doesn't at all diminish the call to chastity that each of us has in our own lives, in our own states, and particularly to live by what I think is the central assertion of Catholic faith in the sexual area, which is, uh, sexuality, sexual activity is something profound rather than something casual. That's where our church really comes up against society. So our society doesn't believe that. And I think across our teachings morally in the sexual world, that's, that's the basic impulse. It's something profound, not something casual. And it's something that teaches, uh, reaches very deeply into the personal, spiritual, moral, uh, emotional lives of people. And so uh, that's all the, the, I'm not challenging any of that. I am simply yeah. saying for us to uh, chart out this one area of human life and say that automatically is, no matter the level of it or anything, that's automatically mortal sin. I don't think that 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 is consistent with the moral universe, the Catholic moral universe of our theology at its best. Hmm. One thing that comes to mind is what you're describing is a very pastoral approach, I would say. Um, and one of the common retorts to to that approach of, you know, meeting people where they're at, um, welcoming them is, you know, that the most loving thing you can do is present people with the truth. Um, I'm wondering how, how you respond to that sort of line of reasoning. Well, I'm going to c cite uh, St. John Paul II here in a very important teaching uh, in Familiaris Consortia, one of his uh, encyclicals, he, he, he said, um, the principle of gradualism lies at the heart of everyone's moral life. Uh, and what that is, it takes, it's, it's rooted in Jesus. When Jesus came to people, he didn't say, you want to follow me, you got to be perfect. If he had, the disciples wouldn't have made it past the first week. I mean, when we, when we look at who they were, and how much they messed up time and again, you know, in the scriptures. He, he doesn't say that. He takes us where we are and calls us to move forward. Yes, it, it doesn't say live life as you want and it doesn't matter whether it accords with the gospel. Or the teacher. That's not what he said. But, but Christ doesn't say you got to leap from where you are at this moment to perfection. That's not our humanity. It doesn't work that way. Uh, uh, Pope Francis has this line that, you know, uh, because uh, grace builds on nature, the grace of God acts progressively in our lives. And, and uh, St. Augustine had that beautiful insight, and uh, I think everyone else who lives finds this to be true. Here he had had a, a, a very, uh, uh, his, let's say, his young adult years were in every way contrary to the gospel, at every level. Uh, and then he became, uh, uh, he had a conversion, he became very close to the church. 
But and he, and he write his Augustine's Confessions are such an important work because, for the first time in Western literature, what they say is, not after my conversion I was good, I I was perfect. Okay, he says all through his Confessions, I'm at the process of coming closer to God, and it's going to be never finished. And even at the end of his life, he says it's un- the end of Confessions is I'm not done yet. God hasn't done his work in me yet. And so uh, I, I think that's how we had to look on the Christian moral life. So that's what I would say to people who say, um, you know, is, is this forsaking uh, the call of Christ? And I've seen people say that. You know, they say, well, uh, uh, Jesus said to the adulterous woman, you know, sin no more. That's true. But they kind of miss, in my view, you miss the point of that parable if that's what you take away from it. It, it, What he says to her, what he says first by the whole event is, don't be judgmental toward this woman. And I think judgmentalism, my own view is, judgmentalism is the worst sin uh, in, 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 in the Christian life, okay? Because that's why Jesus talks about so often. You won't find, if you look at the Gospels, read through them. Time and time and time again, he's talking about judgmentalism. It's because we all do it. We find it so easy to fall into that, and it's so harmful to people. So what the parable of the adulterous woman is about is don't be judgmental. It's not that he he was harsh toward the woman that uh, uh, caught in adultery. He was generous with her. That's the whole thing. Now, he says, yes, live the Christian life, but that's the gradualism, I think, that really lies at the heart of what, what Christ's method was. Well, and so much, and maybe to, I don't know, this is partaking in some of that judgmentalism a little bit, but, like, in my view, a lot of this is just, like, classic, like, prodigal son. Like, we're all living out the parable of the prodigal son all the time, right? And I think a lot of us in the church are just ready to be the older brother to say, like, Father, why didn't you tell, like, tell him about all the things he should have done or that he should start doing or that the way he, even the way he's coming back is wrong. I think there's like a lot of people in the life of the church right now that are just eager to, um, under the guise of proclaiming the truth, um, tell people all the things that they're doing wrong. Well, I had a, 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 a professor of scripture, and he used to say, whenever you read a parable, look at the person you don't like and see yourself <laughs> there. See, that's who you are, or that's who you <laughs> lean toward me. And, and this is... A, clear example of it you know i i i find myself in that position you know of 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 the the older older uh, uh uh son many many times you know why do why do you do something about that person god you know and yet that's not our role and it's it's certainly what not called christ calls us to be and do so yeah i think one other common fear and one that i sometimes share is that you know, if we look at, you know, maybe not changing church teaching, but de-emphasizing some or emphasizing others or um, kind of taking down some of the rules, we, we, we get closer to a place where um, Catholics are, they're going to split. You know, it used to be you're, they're, the saying is, you know, when Protestants disagree, they form new churches. When uh, Catholics disagree, they form new religious orders. But on some of these really fundamental questions about sexuality, uh, women's ordination, um, same-sex marriage, I those don't seem like places where we can just agree to disagree in the long run. And so just having these conversations can bring up some anxiety for Catholics. And so uh, what would you say to someone who, who fears that by, you know, even touching these sensitive issues around um, sexuality that, that we're, we're, you know, risking the scary S word of schism? Um, I think there are a couple issues. One is um, there's another scary word, too, and that is drift, all right? Uh, by not addressing some of these issues of inclusion, we're losing the younger generation. Uh, it just it, it, that's in my own view it's clear that's a big part of the drift of people of young people away from the Catholic Church is 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 um, uh, very uncomfortable posi- feelings about 
issues like on, on uh, women and LGBT uh, in, in terms of the life of the church. So that's one thing. The other thing in a very hopeful way is um, Russ, uh, Russ Douthat had a, a, an article in the New York Times uh, this past week that was on my article and then on something Cardinal Pell had written on that memo. Uh, and, and in which he said, uh, we're heading, he said we're heading towards schism because both sides believe it's all or nothing, it's victory or loss, okay? I don't think that's what synodality is all about. I, I think it's the opposite of synodality. And so as we head into the synodal process of discernment, as I said, the beautiful thing about our local dialogues was people who disagreed came together and in faith shared and were energized and supported in their faith, even though they were disagreeing. That's what we had to strive for. So that the, 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 um, this is not a manifesto that we need to tr be from here. It's, 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 it's gradual, you know, it, it's gradualism too in the life of the church. How do we move towards some of these things? And, and also it's being attentive to the, uh, uh, the hurts uh, of those who are more traditional Catholics too, you know. In, in our dialogues, the, the question of the, uh, 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 the preconciliar mass came up, uh, which people often call the Trinity mass or the Latin mass. It's the mass before the council. And, and many people uh, go to that and feel wounded about the changes recently. We have to attend to that pastorally for, for, for people and try to be of what help we can in our, I as a bishop and then, and, and then uh, people within the church as a whole. So uh, it, it, it's not that it's a win-lose. It's not that uh, what I've written or anybody writes on inclusion is, is the uh, framework for where we got to get to by 2024 or we fail. That isn't it. It's that we've got to ask uh, prayerfully uh, w with people from all over the world. That's the other thing. We're a universal church. Sometimes that's an easy reality and a wonderful reality. Sometimes it's a hard reality to experience. But we're as a universal church going to pray through, work through, and come to some conclusions on these questions. Um, one of the things that I think is not helpful is that some people who uh, um, are opposed to the synod in various ways are ur urging tremendous caution on the synod. Um, uh, many of them don't want any changes. Okay. Well, that's an all-or-nothing victory, too. So let the, 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 we're not, the framework we're seeking is ask where's God's leading us now on these questions. But we've got to tend to the questions. We won't necessarily come out with any one person's uh, conclusions at the end exactly where they framed them. But unless we tend to them, uh, after all these people in these dialogues have presented these questions for us, unless we reflect on them in the light of the church and the gospel, and then I think we will have failed uh, whatever conclusions we come out with. I'm curious because you have staked out some claims in this in this article, uh, for example, on, on women deacons and what you've talked about, inclusivity. Um, how are you spiritually preparing yourself to go into the synod um, with a, with your own mind open to, to being changed by, by what you hear from other parts of the church? Well, I don't know that I'll be at the synod, so... Uh, I, you know, Cardinals so, don't so get an automatic pass. <laughs> no, 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 they don't get an automatic uh, seat. So, uh, <clears throat> but say I'm an observer, I'm back here by diocese watching all this, and uh, I hope those things that I enunciated can come to pass. Some of them are very easy. For example, roles that women have, and it's not just women, lay people as a whole, in terms of running parishes, okay? Uh, when a priest is not a pastor of a parish, they have, a priest can be an administrator. He has both the title and the full functions other than a few things of what a pastor can do. So this is this is a legal distinction in canon law about, you know, administrator and uh, of a parish or whatever. That, that's right. There are certain provisions in canon law which, which uh, don't allow women and, frankly, lay people as a whole to do certain things that they're eminently qualified to do. That's an easy fix. That has nothing to do with doctrine. Uh, 
the Pope uh, took steps in this direction recently when he reformed the Curia, that is the central administration of the church, to allow not non-bishops to be heads of major departments. And that's certainly going to include women and uh, and, lay, and 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 men, lay men. So. Um, uh, uh, so at all levels in the church, that kind of change can and should take place. Um, and I don't think there's tremendous opposition to that except for inertia, you know. And, and so, but it, but it means an effort to change. I mean, it, it, it means a change of consciousness at some levels. Um, the, the diaconate is a harder one because that's a, a long tradition. There's a big question to what degree in the early church did women uh, undertake the role, or were they entrusted with the role of being deacons in the early church? There's a lot of evidence which indicates they were. So it's not the same problem you have with having women priests in the church, because it looks clearly like there were women who were doing the work of deacons and were uh, ordained in various ceremonies. So, so it's easier to do that. And so I think uh, when I was at the Amazon Synod, uh, there were about 200 bishops from Latin America there, the Amazon region, they were overwhelmingly in favor of women deacons. It was a proposal. It didn't get adopted because we were only a regional city and we thought, well, we shouldn't do a universal principle on that. But there was overwhelming support. So I think that will be, a, 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 that's not a major change in doctrine. You know, getting back to Ashley's question a little bit. You don't know if you'll be at the upcoming synod, but maybe just in your general approach to practicing synodality um, in your home diocese and in your in your life as a bishop, how, what are like some things you do to like stay open to the spirit or open to the person in front of you who you maybe like nominally disagree with? Um, because I think that's a like real temptation for all of us to kind of fall into is to just like have our, our priors like always wanting to be confirmed all the time. Uh, yes, uh, and I say it's a temptation for bishops pretty severely. Um, partly where I had to restrain myself is not giving my viewpoints in a determinative way. Even if I'm not intending to be determinative, they have that effect. Mm. Uh, but truly listening, and I mean listening to every view before uh, sometimes commenting on things, uh, it, that's important. So I've tried to be changing that. But it's not it, th those parts are hard to become synodal in your participation. What we did in our in our uh, small group sharing, I'll have to say, we, we we followed a process that was developed for prisons for prisons, and it was called the council mm -hmm. process. And what it was is you, they sit in circles, which took place in most diocese. But the the innovation we had was uh, there was prayer and everything that set it up. But the, it was only one person was talking at a time, and then they talked as, within reason as long as they want to. And then no one could interrupt, no one could say anything, no could e could make a, even an aside or anything. So we had, according to this process, there's a little piece that the speaker holds in his or her hand. And it's, it's a visible symbol, I'm talking now. And it was amazing. We used a little cross. It was, and then you pass it around. It was an amazing... People didn't violate that rule. And, and, and so it, that's what made listening, where you're truly listening, rather than thinking about what am I going to say next to make my point, rather listening to what profoundly to what people have to say. So that's a huge change in our culture that, that we have to do. Um, and, and then inclusion is a major element of this, is how do we invite in people who don't feel empowered and included and, and wanted in the life of the church. Uh, when we did our, our, our study, our statistical study uh, of the 27,000 people, one of the questions was, um, if, if I stopped coming to church, to my parish, would I be missed? And a shocking number of people put no. Um, uh, there was a study that... Uh, uh, the Gallup organization did some years ago. Why do people come, keep coming? This was across denominations. And the, the, the central one was if they feel they would be missed if they stopped coming. That is, if they matter, if it matters to people that they're there. And so that's something we got to work on to make in our communities not only more welcoming, but make people feel they count in various ways. So...
There's a whole cultural change that can and should occur at each level in the life of our our church at the universal, at the diocesan level, at the parish level, uh, and in terms of people's own lives. And that's a big challenge, but I, I think that's the most rewarding thing that lies before us. You mentioned um, the role of women in the church as being maybe one of the lower hanging fruit where there's more agreement, less cha- less official change to church teaching is needed. Um, I think in terms of inclusion, the other group that often comes up in these conversations is LGBT Catholics. And there, I think, one, there's not as much agreement in the U.S. and in the global church um, about about how we should approach LGBT Catholics. And two, we we have this language in um, about it being um, homosexuality being intrinsically disordered um, and the distinction you mentioned in your piece about orientation and sexual activity. Uh, so that that's I know this is a <laughs> big, big question, but um, how is that a place where, you know, you would advocate for change in that language, change in yeah, church discipline? I have, I have and others have. I, I, I've, I've said for some years I felt and others have, too, rather prominently, that the intr- intrinsically disordered language is a disservice. The problem is. It's, it's used in that catechism as a philosophical term. It makes one's, but to us in our country and really most of the world, disorder is thought of as psychological. And that, it's a terrible word and it, sh- it should be taken out of the catechism, yes. Um, on, the, on the question of the distinction between um, uh, you know, a- activity and orientation, uh, the point I was trying to make in the article was God's embrace of LGBT uh, people, like the church's embrace, should be whether they're active or not. It, that, that, should not be, uh, that should not determine whether we seek to include people, reach out to them, uh, look on them as fellow strivers with strengths and weaknesses and things, areas where they're doing well. And fall. So my, uh, uh, it's, it's not that the difference between activity and orientation doesn't matter, it does. But that shouldn't be the foundation for how we approach LGBT people. We should across the board be saying, we look on you like us, people who are trying in often difficult circumstances to live our lives here in this world, uh, to live by the gospel the best we can, knowing that we fail knowing that sometimes we fail time and again in the same area. That's one of the things about human nature. Uh, when I was a, a pre- young priest, and I was hearing confessions a lot. People would come and say, oh, I'm so upset that I, I'm confessing the same sins over and over again, no matter what area their lives are. That's how we are, because we have the, it, our personalities have a rather rigid structure to them. So we're, where we find it hard in one year, it's probably 10 years now where we're going to find it hard too. So. That's the framework, I think, for us to look on this whole LGBT questions. Uh, my pastoral vision and goal here in San Diego is to make, and it's hard to accomplish this, to make LGBT people feel equally welcome in the life of the church as everyone else. And so hmm. that how we get from here to there, I, it's, it's hard and we take steps, but that's my goal. And I really feel that, that's Christ, that Christ would totally agree with that. That, that, that he'd want every person, every LGBT person, and their families to feel equally welcome in the life of the church. Uh, one big fear, Cardinal, I have, and uh, I, I'm really worried about the synod, maybe for different reasons than other people, but I think now that we've undergone this massive listening exercise, I think it's one thing to uh, sort of ignore people um, and not ask for their opinion. It's an entirely other thing to ask for their opinion and disregard it. And so if we get to the end of all of this and we, there is not a lot of agreement or reconciliation on some of these, these things that feel like they're irreconcilable, I worry that we're going to lose an entire generation, my generation and and beyond. Uh, Am I right to be afraid? Um, Let me say yes and no. Okay. I have some of that same fear. Okay. In other words, the synodality is very diffuse, okay? The one interesting thing is all these reports from all over the world, with a few exceptions, are pointing to common themes. There are some differences, but they're really common themes overall. 
That's a stunningly important reality. I, I would say the reason not to be worried, or I'm not so as worried as I would be ordinarily, is I went to this Amazon Synod, all right? <clears throat> and they had this listening press process there. And frankly, when I heard about it, I thought, oh, give me a break. How, how are you going to have the 9 million people in the Amazon region, most of whom are Catholic, ha- consulted and come out with some some commonality to it and report that would make sense. They did. A tremendous amount of good got accomplished. Not everything that was on the agenda got accomplished. But I have the sense that the people who participated in the process in that moment in, in the Amazon felt there was an integrity to what what was done with their input and then as it came to various levels reflected upon and then in the, the Universal Synod as a whole. I feel that had a good outcome. And that was a very diverse area where they have huge problems, um, tremendous challenges, you know, uh, the economic devastation, the exploitation that goes on, uh, the creation that's being ruined. Uh, They have the same thing, tremendous challenge of no priests. What do you do when you're a Eucharistic community and you have no priests? They have Eucharist once a year, many of these places. So all these challenges and they came up with a composite, and a lot of that was was accomplished, but some of it wasn't. And yet I feel everybody at the end felt it was a good process with integrity that they were pretty glad they had participated. I mean at all levels. So, yeah. Cardinal, I want to thank you for uh, taking so much time with us to continue the conversation uh, about your article in America. Uh, we do have one final question that we ask all of our guests here on Jesuitical, and that is if you could canonize one person, living or dead, Catholic or not, fictional or real, who would it be and why? Well, I'll tell you, uh, I, 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 uh, I would canonize St. Francis again. I would double- whoa, whoa, okay, hang on. <laughs> let, 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 me, let, me, let me tell you why. All right. I believe, other than the Blessed Mother, St. Francis is the greatest saint for us, particularly in our times, but in the life of the church. That is, um, in, in his understanding of renunciation of the total acceptance and uh, embrace of the gospel, of his reaching out to other people of all different kinds, you know. He went to the Muslim world and dialogued. Uh, his appreciation for the beauty of creation uh, and, and for the presence and grace of God in so many ways in people's lives. I think that, he, that speaks. So I'm going to give him two canonizations. Two that, canonizations. All right. St. Francis Squared. I'm not sure whether that's a doctrinally authentic answer but it's it's in case the first one wasn't done right i'd give him another because i think he's such a sterling figure for our times to inspire us all right that's another first for our show yeah no one has tried to recanonize <laughs> someone so in in the rules that we've totally made up we will make an exception all right <laughs> you just asked why canonize you didn't say it had to be someone who had been <laughs> that's true that's a very good point that's a very <laughs> jesuitical way around that uh Colonel McElroy, thank you so much. Um, uh, again, we will link to the article in our show notes. Um, and we hope to uh, read you in America again soon. Great. Or Commonweal. Yes. Common. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for watching. Before you go, subscribe to our channel. And if you enjoyed this conversation, the best way to support us is through a digital subscription to America. You can subscribe at americamagazine.org slash subscribe. Thanks so much.